Good morning. The name of this lesson this morning is Salvation's Effect on the Body, Soul, and Spirit. And we'll be uh, looking at all over the Bible. And I just suggest that if you want to study this further, give me your email and I'll mail it to you. Or uh, just go on the internet, watch it over and and again and slow it down and stop it and stuff because there's a lot here and only got 45 minutes to cover it. In Isaiah chapter 57, 15 it says, And thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy places, place with him also is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Salvation requires that you humble your spirit. There is nothing special about you. There is no power in you. God does not stay awake at night worrying about you. He doesn't need you. You need Him. And you approach Him in a contrite, humbled spirit. I wish the world would learn that. In Psalms chapter 34, verse 18, it says, the, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Now we're going to be looking at the body, the soul, and the spirit. We'll probably start with the soul first because the body and the soul are connected, especially if you're, you're lost. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and, and soul and body be preserved blameless, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that You'll give me the gift of teaching this morning, Lord. I need the Holy Spirit. I can't teach this by myself, Lord. Lord, I pray that You'll be with every word that proceeds out of my mouth, Lord. Let this vessel be used. And I pray that if anyone's lost today, Lord, that they'll have a better understanding of what's going to happen if they don't receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be your holy and righteous name, for I ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What is the soul of man? The soul of man, it can be seen. In Revelation chapter 6, 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that are slain in the, for the word of God. Your body has a shape. It's just like the body that you have right now, except uh, if you'd walk out of your body, you would look just like you, you would. You wouldn't even know you were out of your body. In some cases, when these near-death experiences, people mention the fact they didn't know they were dead until they saw their body laying on the, on the gurney. In Revelation, uh, Revelation uh, or First, Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse two says, "I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth." So, when you die, you're going to walk right out of that body. The soul can be clothed when. Um, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 11, when the saints during the tribulation are, uh, are killed, their souls go up to the, to the third heaven. In Revelation chapter 6, 11, he says, And white robes were given to every one of them, so they can be clothed. So there's a lot about the soul that we don't really think about too much. A soul can feel pain. A soul can feel thirst. A soul has a presence of mind to, to know what's going on right before him. He can also, he knows the presence, he knows the future, and he knows what happened in the past. Just read 
uh, Luke chapter 16 about the rich man who died and went to hell. He is there in some sort of body, conscious of everything that's going on around him. We see the saved soul has all its body parts. He tells Lazarus, go and find, touch, dip his finger in, in water and come and touch my tongue for I'm, uh, I'm th he's thirsty. He's, he's wanting water. Every, every person that's ever been burnt real bad, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is water. They want water. They feel like if they can get enough water, that will take care of everything. And that's the same way in hell. You're going to be screaming for water. You're going to be wanting some type of, of your thirst quenched. In John chapter 14 verse 9 it says, I have been with you so long a time with you, this is Jesus talking, and yet hast thou not known me. Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Jesus Christ's soul and spirit were, was God. Now think about that. If Jesus Christ was God, who went to the cross? Who suffered and died for your sins? It was God Himself. We'll get into that here in just a second. No man hath seen God at any time. So it's just like looking at me. You see my body, but you don't see me. The real me is my soul and the spirit that's inside me. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this body's already dead. Anybody over 33 years old knows that something's happening to their body, that they're deteriorating. And the longer they go, the more deteriorating their body gets. I went to a dermatologist the other day and she cut all kinds of stuff off. <laughs> I mean, it's just terrible how old we get so quickly. But the natural man, 1 Corinthians chapter 2.14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. So when you see Jesus Christ, when they looked at Jesus Christ, they didn't know who He was. It wasn't until they received the Spirit of God that they understood who Jesus Christ really was. And they were willing to die for Him. Even a torturous death. And Christians around the world, once they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, are willing to die a torturous death rather than deny Him. It's been going on for the last 2,000 years. You think there might be something to this? I think so. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 says, Therefore, when He cometh into the world, He saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Jesus Christ was prepared a body. He, and he, he was indwelt by the Holy Spirit and the soul of God. Everything about Him was God. Everything. Without Christ, you're nothing more than a dead man walking. You can't do anything except for what the body wants to do. In fact, when you get into this, you'll find out that the, in the Old Testament, they compared an unsafe person to a beast. A beast has a soul and he has a body. People back in the Old Testament, before Jesus Christ come and died for our sins, when Adam sinned, his soul, his spirit left his body. He no longer, he was just a two part being. And that body and that soul were welted together. Whatever the body did, the soul did. And we'll see that here in just a second. But what happened? What was the effect of sin on a, on, on a person? In Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 says, 
But of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. When Adam ate the fruit, his spirit died. His body died a day later. Almost a day later. Well, you say, well, he lived almost 930 years. What is a day to God? It's just a thousand years. Everyone died less than a thousand years. 935 for Adam. 600, uh, 965 for, for Methuselah, the oldest man in the Bible. They all died short of a thousand years. What else happened? When Adam was, when Eve was created in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, God says something funny that just didn't click right. He says, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Where's the blood? How come blood is not mentioned here? But blood is mentioned after Adam sinned, but not before Adam sinned. What I believe is, and it's, it's taught quite a bit, I, I mean, I didn't make this up, but they believe that Adam, when he was first created, he had water flowing through his veins. And it wasn't until sin came into the world and Adam lost his glow. He lost his, the, the light that, that covered him, him and Eve both. When Adam fought, saw Eve right after she ate the fruit, he knew something was different. She was naked. She was no longer glowing white, but she was red. Because now, blood flowed through her veins. It was red. And the Bible teaches this over and over again. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, He told His disciples, He says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me, and see, for the Spirit hath not flesh and blood, as ye see me have. So something happened to His blood. It was shed on the cross. When He rose again the third, third day, He was just like He was before the cross. What flowed through His veins was no longer water. It was blood. Because the Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So that blood had to be done away with. When did, when did this happen? I believe it was at Gethsemane. When He was crying out to God, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will. And he sweated great drops of blood. He became sin for us. What happened to Adam when he sinned happened to Jesus Christ for us. The chemistry of, of God died for us. When the soldier perished his side, water and blood came out. Why does he want you to make that distinction? It's because there's something to blood and water. What did he tell the woman at the well? He says, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for, for water. Because I can give you living water. What's the living water? That was what was flowing through his veins. You know, when he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he is the resurrection and the life. And you can only get this living water from the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he didn't have blood inside his body. Because God will not do anything to counterdict his word. He took the blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 3, verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now appear in the presence of God. And who is that can stand before God? He that hath a clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. The only way you can stand before Jesus Christ is be hid in Him. He is our righteousness. He's our hope. There's nothing else out there. And no matter how great you think you are, you're nothing compared to Jesus Christ. We are nothing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49, it says, And ye, and as ye have borne the image of the earthly, we also shall also bear image of the heavenly. Something has to happen to our body before we can stand in the presence of God. And I say unto you, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot in inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So we have to be changed. We have to have a body like His body. And this might be disturbing to think that Jesus Christ had something other than blood running through His veins or that Adam had something running through His veins before but we'll get into that. God sets this example all through the Bible. The first miracle that Jesus did was to show you that there is a difference. Every time you take communion, it's reminded of what Jesus Christ went through for you on the cross. Moses when he was told to go into the to the to Egypt and he went to the Pharaoh and he says let my people go and the Pharaoh says no no we're going to let no people go so Moses went down to the river Nile and he took his staff and he put it in the water what did the water become why it's a symbol of sin it's a symbol of what happens when you reject the Lord Jesus Christ Adam and Eve rejected the word of the Lord and it cost them everything. It cost them their virtue. It cost them their innocence. It cost them their righteousness. And now Moses is showing Egypt that when you reject the, the God, now you have blood. Jesus... When he started his ministry, he went to a, a wedding. And during this wedding, they ran out of wine to drink. And Jesus' mother went to him and said, they have no wine. Jesus said, okay. He said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus Christ is telling us something there. He's, he's telling us that we better pay attention to what's going on here. This is not just an ordinary wedding. This is not going to be just ordinary wine. This is going to be something different. And he told his servants, the mother said to the servants, whatever he saith, do. And there were six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two to three Firkins a piece. That's 72 to 162 gallons. That's a lot of wine for a little wedding. That's enough wine to take care of all of Jerusalem. So why did he do this? There's not, nothing is accidental in the Word of God. Everything has a purpose. And he says, pour out this water because all these Jews have come to this wedding were washing their hands and their feet and their faces and blowing their nose and everything else. And this water was pretty ranch 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 it. And he says, told the servants, go pour it out. 
These six pots represented from the time of creation till the time we leave this world how man has defiled himself. Amen. And these pots were defiled. They were no good. You couldn't drink that water. It, only, it had to be thrown away. Something had to take its place. It wasn't fit for sacrifice. So Jesus Christ says, pour, fill them up with new water, clean water. And then He said, now dip into it now. And it came out wine. Wine is a substitute for blood in the Bible. Jesus Christ in His pure righteousness, He had enough righteousness to take care of all the sins of the world, but before He could be crucified, blood had to be spilled. So Jesus Christ became sin for us who knew no sin. His body, that living water, turned to blood temporarily for us. It was spilled, he was broken and spilled out for us. For without blood, there is no remission of sin. There has to be blood. That's God's requirement. Hebrews 10, 5 says, But a body has been prepared for me. My grace is sufficient. That grace is the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. And it's sufficient. That's why it took 72, and not just a few gallons, it was 72 to 162 gallons of water, or of wine. And if you reject that wine, you reject Him. You reject that blood, you reject Him. Jesus told the woman at the well, and He hath given, he hath given thee living water. That water was flowing through His veins. He became sin for us. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, Though they be red like crimson, they should be white as wool. Something had to change. But He became sin for us. Leviticus chapter 5 verse 2 says, If a soul touches anything, the last part of the verse says, He also shall be unclean and guilty. So the soul and the, and the body are connected in the Old Testament. It refers to him as like brute beast in Numbers chapter 31, verse 28. It says, uh, halfway through the verse, it says, One soul of 500, both of a person and of the beeves, which is uh, like a bull or an ox, and of the asses and of the sheep. If you're without Jesus Christ, you're just like a brute beast. And the Bible says in Second. Peter chapter 2 verse 12 says, But these as brute beasts may to be taken and destroyed. Talking about the unsaved world. Before he... Uh, when man started out, he was eating from the trees of the garden. When, when he sinned, Adam had to start digging in the ground and eating the roots and digging into the ground. After the flood... He had to eat from the trees, dig in the ground, and eat the animals. It's harder to stay alive in these bodies, but Jesus Christ is giving you the opportunity for eternal life. When Rachel died, her soul departed from her body. When, you're, when you die, that's the only time, if you're unsaved, that's the only time your, your soul is going to be separated from your body. It's going to go to one place or the other. If you're without Christ, it's going to go. It's going to drop like a lead weight. And if you if you do any of these uh, videos of people who died, their they say they their bodies once their body is dead, their soul drops like a lead weight and goes right through the ground and straight into hell. And these people report that there's worms down there. 
and the beggar died and lifted up his eyes. He didn't lift anything else up, he just lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Abraham, Abraham had, a, had an unconditional covenant with God. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. The Jews had an unconditional or had a conditional um, agreement with God. As long as they served God, they lived for God, the Spirit of God would dwell with them. But once they started sinning, the Spirit would leave them. You have the opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and His Spirit that will dwell with you unconditionally forever and He reserves you a place in heaven. That's a great deal. You need to get in on it before it's too late. Exodus chapter 35, verse 21, it talks about the Jews. And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom the, his spirit made willing to contribute to, the, to building the temple. The spirit was there. They had an unconditional agreement. You live by the law, you do your sacrifices, and the spirit will stay with you. You start sinning against God, the spirit leaves. But it's not like that with us today. But it will be again as soon as this rapture takes place. It'll go right back to where it was before. You need to be saved. Don't try to go through the tribulation. It ain't going to work. Abraham had to be sac uh, circumcised. Why? Because his seed was corrupt. Everyone born after Adam seed is corrupt. He made a covenant with God and of course circumcision there's blood involved. And that blood was and every Jew that ever uh, followed God had to be circumcised. It is very important because the seed is corrupt. Jesus Christ, uh, Adam or Abraham the seed was going to come through Abraham so it had to be something had to be done to identify him as being Separated from God, uh, separated from the world. So circumcision was brought in. When Moses was going to Egypt, God stopped him before he got there and said, "You haven't circumcised your sons, and I'm going to kill you." And Moses quickly circumcised his children, and he was able to proceed. There is something that's really prophetic here that you need to understand. When Adam, when Abraham started circumcised, everybody had to be circumcised. A blood covenant is involved in that circumcision, whether the kids knew it or not. And Jesus Christ was going to come through that seed of Abraham. And they had to be obedient. But when he does, when we're born again, he does a circumcision just like He did with, with Abraham and all the children of Israel. That circumcision is cutting away that soul from your flesh. You know, when, you're, when that, that soul is, is adhering to that flesh, wherever that body goes, that's where the soul goes. Whatever that body does, it affects the soul and your conscience and everything about you. And, and if you're left alone and you have no, uh, no restrictions, that body will drag you to hell as fast as it can possibly go. And it's only by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit that we receive that this doesn't happen. When you look at... Um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even dividing the sunder, the souls and the spirit, and the joints and the morrows, and is of the discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. God goes in and does an operation. Colossians chapter 2, I believe, 
covers this too. It says God does an operation. He goes in and he starts slicing away the soul from the body and he makes them two separate. Once that happens, the first thing you realize when you get saved is, I can't do that anymore. I'm sorry guys, I can't go to the bar anymore. I can't do this anymore. I have to do what the Spirit is leading my soul to do. You're actually, when you get saved, you're dragging your dead body around for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years, however you live. You're just dragging that thing around like a zombie. And it's doing what your soul tells it to do. Or your Spirit of God tells, you, tells it what to do. Before that, you have no control of it. But now you do. You become a new creature in Christ. And that new creature isn't complete until you get that new body because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. You get rid of that dead body and get you a new live one that lives forever and never has any strength and you never have to have anything cut off of it. That's great. It's a, de it's a great deal. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's what you want. Crucify that flesh every day. Say no to what the flesh wants. The music of this world will drag you to hell. The... the uh, Media and all the stuff that movies and all this other garbage out there. I mean, I read every day about people being, little kids being sacrificed and they find their, I mean, the devil's alive and well in America. He's alive and well around the world. And all he wants to do is drag your soul into hell. He doesn't want you to hear what I'm telling you right now. I would be scared to death if I was lost today. I remember when I got saved, I was scared to death. When Jesus Christ came to me and showed me my, that I was a sinner, all I wanted to do is get saved. I was scared. I had to ride a motorcycle 20 miles to the church, and I was, Lord, just get me there, you know. I was scared. I realized what I was and who I was. And I was nothing without Him. I was on my way to a devil's hell. So what did Jesus do when He died on the cross for me? Luke chapter 24 verse 7 says, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquaintance with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Before you're saved, you despise the Lord Jesus Christ. You despise Christians. I remember I've, every time I went to church, I thought, hypocrite, hypocrite, until I got saved. Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet it esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions, He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. But what else happened? John chapter 3 verse 14 says, As Moses has lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Psalms chapter 22, verse 6. But I am a worm and no man. Jesus Christ became a serpent, a worm in our stead. He became that red, hideous thing that God hated. God despised it. But He became that for you. And to reject Him is to reject God's Word and reject God. And you don't deserve nothing less than what I'm going to read. 
you need to be saved. There is only one who can enter God's throne, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to have a pure heart, clean hands, and your soul can't be lifted up in vanity. None of us qualify, only the Lord Jesus Christ. But He became a worm and no man for you and me. What can a woman or a man expect when they reject the Son of God? Let's look at it. Without exception, you will go to hell. Without exception, you will be there until the white throne judgment. When Satan fell, he went from being the most beautiful being that God ever created. He was over the throne. He provided light and music for the throne of God until sin was found. Pride. And then God cast him out and he became a red dragon. The serpent in the garden went from being a four-legged beast that was pretty, that ate grass like, a, like an ox. He went down to a snake crawling on his belly like a worm. You see the progression here? Or see, see, the, see what we're, where we're going with this? People say, well, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to have a good time with all my buddies. No, you ain't. No, you ain't. You're going to get, if you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to get exactly what came to the devil, what came to that serpent in the garden, and what became a man. He became, a, he became red, where he was white, with light, he was clothed with light. He was brilliant. He didn't have to work like we do today. We're not devol evolving, we're devolving. And we're going down more all the time. You talk to these, uh, these people that study genetics and they say that, that before too long, man's not going to exist because his DNA is so corrupt. Cancer, heart disease, all that stuff is part of the devolving process. When the rich man looked up, he, he lifted up his eyes in hell and being in torment. He was like a worm in hell. You say, well, I don't believe people are going to be a worm in hell. I think that's just figuratively. There ain't nothing figuratively in the Bible. It's all literal. Isaiah 14, 11 talks about when Satan is cast into the lake of fire. He says, The pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. There's a lot of worms down there. There's a lot of people that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 66, 24. Mark chapter 9, verse 44. 46 and 48. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Well, you say, well, I don't believe that's in the Bible. That's not in my Bible. It's in the King James Bible. It's in the original text, if you can find one. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You are going to be a worm if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to be a worm in hell. Alone, burning forever and ever. Romans chapter 7, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. As long as you're in this body, you're going to sin. But you're not held accountable for what goes on in this body because it's been paid for. Jesus Christ paid, paid it all on the cross. But you will be responsible for how, what you do 
for the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. This is closing. For as by one man's disobedient, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That's the good news. You trust the Lord Jesus Christ and you have no worries whatsoever. It's all going to be good. Trust Him. And if you have lost loved ones, shock them into... Because into, uh, this, stuff, this stuff used to be taught a lot. It's not taught anymore. People want to give you a friendly gospel or a friendly hell. It's not a friendly hell. It's, and the gospel is the only thing good in the Bible. Everything else is negative in the Bible except for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only positive thing in the Bible. God is warning man, and man is not listening. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You, Lord, for Your precious Word. We thank You, Lord, for the things that are in Your Word that are there to warn us about what's coming. People in their pride think that they can escape, but Lord, there's no one that's going to escape. Lord, thank You for Your salvation. Thank You for saving my wretched, miserable soul. Lord, help me to live for You. And help anyone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Lord, I pray that today will be their day of salvation. To not put it off. There's nothing good in man. The only thing good in this world is the Lord Jesus Christ. And even so, come Lord Jesus, for us in Jesus Christ. Amen.